Hello everyone, I'm your host as always, Mr. Lindley. Momentum and impulse. Some say you can't run from momentum. Others say this unit doesn't make any sense. For more, we go to our field correspondent, JJ. Thanks, Mr. Lindley. Momentum and impulse is in fact a topic you cannot run from. Speaking from personal experience, I was in the woods the other day, minding my own business, and I was actually chased by a floating green head. I tried to get away from it, and I surely couldn't. Now, in speaking with some physics people, they have told me you can't get away from this topic because it is, it is foundational. It is a topic that combines things like forces, kinematics, and energy all into one topic. It seems like all of the units are colliding into one. Back to you. Fascinating stuff. Thank you, JJ. I don't know where you were, but that building looks amazing, and I bet the students that go there are some of the best students ever to exist. For more on this topic, let's head to the classroom with Mr. Lindley. Hey, thanks for that little intro, and you know what? We're ready to rock with momentum and impulse today, right? We're getting ready to look. Let's, let's, let's pop those equations up there, right? Those ones we're using. So let's talk about first, what even is momentum? What even is this? Now, I think equations, you know, can certainly help us. And, and you know, we'll write that out. Uh, lowercase p for momentum. P. For momentum. And then M B M V being mass and velocity. Momentum for us fundamentally is a measure of how difficult it is to stop an object. Now, if we think about what it means to, to be difficult to stop, it doesn't necessarily just have to be a very, very massive object. It doesn't necessarily have to be something always going fast. So, you know, a train that is going very fast obviously is very hard to stop, especially if you're, you're Tobey Maguire in Spider-Man 2, right? It, it's extremely difficult, right? But it's also, it, it could be, a, you know, a mix of those things. So a train you know, or a truck that is going very slowly is still kind of hard to stop because it's a truck, right? So we'd say that has a large momentum because it's difficult to stop, right? Uh, if I have a large truck going fast, that's even harder to stop. But, you know, if I had something like a clementine and someone were to toss it at me uh, just very lightly, that's actually fairly easy to stop, right? Because a clementine has a small mass, right? And it's not going very fast. But now, if we're supposed to make it even smaller, so what if someone, you know, were to throw, you know, an, an eraser at me? So the, you know, it's a little small eraser. It's low mass, and if they're throwing it, it's also easy to stop. But if we have a, something that's very, very tiny mass but very, very high speed, you know, something like a bullet. Bullets are very, very difficult for, to stop, especially with our human bodies, right? The mass is really, really small, but the velocity is enormous. So momentum fundamentally is a measure of how difficult it actually is to stop stuff. Now, with momentum, we typically talk a heck of a lot about these things called collisions. And now collisions get kind of interesting because this is how we're going to connect, as you, you heard a little bit ago, this is how we're going to connect all the things. We're going to connect energy. We're going to connect dynamics. We're going to bring in kinematics. Basically, everything we study up into this moment, we can now bring into one singular unit. So if I have momentum, and we talk about momentum being related to velocity, right? Momentum being a vector, since velocity is also a vector, that means momentum can actually change. And this is where we bring in this idea of something called impulse. And no, not when you buy the candy bar at the register. You just, you hadn't had a Twix in a while, and you just really wanted a Twix, because you're like, do they even still taste the same? And just like... Anyway, uh, impulse officially for us is defined as a change in momentum. And impulse, uh, of course, the symbol is capital J, which, you know, J for impulse. It makes perfect sense. And impulse is about a change in momentum. Now, how can we change momentum? Well, to change momentum, we'd have to change the velocity. And how can we change the velocity of something? You guessed it forces. So I'm going to have to apply a force to that object in order to get an impulse. Now, if we think about, you know, a, a me trying to catch something or a me trying to stop something, I can stop things in many different ways, right? I could stop something with a lot of force very, very quickly, or if I'm only going to apply a little bit of force, it's going to take me a lot longer. And this is where we get that idea of, of fat. <laughs> fat. Not with a pH, but like... Okay! Um being that I can apply a force in time differently. So we talked, uh, you know, common examples are things like airbags or safety devices in vehicles. So if we were to think about 
you know, why we like something like, like an airbag. If I were to have a collision to occur, no matter what, my given collision is going to have a given change in momentum, right? The car is going to go from moving to no longer moving. It's going to have a given change in momentum. But one way we could do this without an airbag would be a very tiny amount of time. And what that would cause is an enormous amount of force to be exerted on the body. Or if I bring airbags into this, I can have the time be enormous. And what that does is then decrease the amount of force that's interacting with my body. So because again, we're getting an inverse relationship here because we're talking about a constant change of momentum either way. And foundationally, this is uh, what we deal with uh, in, in collisions. And this is how safety equipment is de designed for sports. Uh, why did I say it? Right, Mr. Lindley, protective equipment for our sports heroes out there, designed using a variety of foams, fabrics, and plastics. The whole idea here, trying to make sure we can increase delta T as large as possible. Whether we're protecting internal organs, extremities, or <laughs> the old noggin, we want to make sure that the force experienced by our athletes is as small as possible. I can personally attest to the protective abilities of helmets. Uh, man, that bucket saved me from a few concussions, <laughs> just not all of them. Still got a couple. Back to you. Thanks for that. Uh, great little interlude. So this is how we're designing sports equipment to make sure that, you know, when there is a collision, we can increase the time, right, which would decrease the force, which is why there's certain paddings in certain spots. And we're using foams and other sort of bendable plastics. And what we had done, uh, and what I think one of the more useful things, is not to just think about momentum um, uh, impulse sort of separately. We had sort of thought about this as being, well, if momentum is mv, then that means change of momentum would really be m, and there's got to be a delta somewhere on the other side of the equation. Now, mass isn't going to change. <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> unless they get afraid. So then we can actually write this as we did uh, on a regular basis as fat math. And officially this is known as the impulse momentum theorem and this is one of the more useful things we can do because we're combining forces, right? We're combining momentum all in one. And for those of you thinking that this might uh, look a little familiar, uh, if you were, I don't know, to divide both sides by delta T, you might notice that right there, uh, delta V divided by delta T. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's like A, so this is a lot like, ma. it's almost like physics is all connected. Because it is. Uh, so if we're talking about a, a collision, right, uh, there are two main types of collisions that we talk about. Uh, the first one is known as an elastic collision, and the second is an inelastic collision. Elastic. Spelling is hard. With an elastic collision, we're going to get what we'll call conservation of momentum. The cons of mom. She doesn't have any. He's an angel. Conservation of momentum. But with an elastic collision, we're also going to get uh, conservation of mechanical energy. And if you haven't watched the energy video, I would definitely go uh, give that a watch. But in elastic collision, we're still going to get conservation of momentum. Mom doesn't have cons. He said the same joke twice. This guy's out of his mind. Uh, but we get no conservation of mechanical energy. And the big reason for this, uh, cons of me. <laughs> I have a couple. The jokes are one, I think. And with an inelastic collision, we typically get something known as deformation. Now, deformation means that we're changing shape. And because we're getting changing shape, we're going to get our, our good friend, Q. My dog? No! Heat. So when we have things that squish, so if I have you know something like this uh, lovely little minion guy, if he were to be in a collision, he would in fact squish, and that squish is going to actually generate heat. Now there is a special case of inelastic collisions, uh, something called a perfectly inelastic collision. 
Uh, and this is where the objects stick together. So they are becoming one after the collision. These tend to be pretty common for us to, to discuss. Uh, it makes the math a little bit simpler, but it also has some interesting repercussions for us to talk about in terms of energy conservation. It also makes it very, very clear, because if I have a, two, a collision where two things hitting each other, I don't instantly know whether or not it's an elastic or inelastic collision. If I have two things stuck together, I know 100% that it has to be an inelastic collision. So let's go through you know, an example of two. We talk about this idea of conservation of momentum. Now, conservation of momentum is very, very similar to conservation of energy. Uh, and when we talk about this, we typically talk about P before being equal to P after. So the momentum I have prior to the collision has to be equal to the momentum after the collision. Now, the interesting thing that you sort of see here with the, with the collision types, uh, conservation of momentum is the one conservation uh, law. Conservation of energy, yeah, yeah, sure. But conservation of momentum is like, like that's, that's the amazing one um, because that's the one that works just sort of wholeheartedly. So uh, we'll do a little example. So let's imagine uh, that I have a ground and I have a block that is in motion and I have a second block uh, that is at rest. Okay, so this is by before time. And then I'm going to have them collide. Okay, and I'm going to have um, them stick together and they'll move off in the after times. Now to set this up, P before equals P after. In the beginning, uh, if I call this like one and two, you can see I have a momentum of one plus a momentum of two, and in the end, I'm gonna think of the, this as being momentum of the system since they're connected. Now the second block actually wouldn't have any momentum because it's not initially moving, right? And now to do this, I could then you know, carry this out with algebra and then sort of solve this. Now, you know, important sort of, um, you know, secondary problem is, is what if I have a scenario where I have block one moving this way, but my second block is actually moving this way in the before time, right? And then, you know, afterwards, maybe, maybe uh, they stick together, but we don't know what they do. So I would still have the momentum of one, and I would also have the momentum of the second, and this would again become uh, momentum cis in the end. But the difference is, one of these two momenta is going to have to be negative. So because momentum is a vector and because direction matters, I'm going to define that way as positive, which would negate this P2, that momentum 2. And then I could uh, carry this out and solve for V cis, the velocity of the system, and I'd be able to figure out um, which way the system would go uh, sort of in the end. Now, obviously, lots of different scenarios that we could, we could get with momentum. We just sort of set them up um, however we want. Um, but now let, let's just, you know, think, how do you know in a problem whether or not, if it is a collision, how do I know if I'm going to do P before P after, after, or whether or not I'm going to bring in my good buddy, my good friend, Fat Map? Easy, clear way for us to indicate this would be what's the system? If I have singular objects, it's going to be fat math, right? If I have something external acting on my object, we're going to use fat math. If I'm going to have, I'm talking about all the objects, and I care about all the objects simultaneously, that's when we'll do P before P after. Because if we think about these examples, right, uh, uh, in this, this first one, right, this first block has momentum, the second block does not. And then when they're moving, the second block is gaining momentum, while the first block is losing momentum. But overall, the system would conserve. So because we're getting conservation of momentum here, right? Uh, and in a, in a scenario like this, uh, this final velocity for this one, this, this is actually going to end up going slower because we saw the mass of the system increase. But if I have just a singular object, and, and fat mav, we can bring in so many different ways. So if I have an object that's being kicked, it's being punched, it's being pushed, I can bring fat mav in because that is a collision that's happening. Even though it's not two objects colliding, if it is just a hand or a bat or a stick or a club that's colliding with something, we're still getting a collision so we can bring in fat mav there. Now one last important thing to keep in mind about all of this is graphing. So if I have a force time graph and it is whatever shape it is, the important thing about this is the area under this graph here, uh, the area for force time graphs is actually impulse, pulse, writing is tough, also known as change in momentum. So important thing there, sometimes you're given a graph and asked to do stuff, uh, asked about the object, and that's how you would know. Well, I hope uh, you don't find uh, too many collisions with this information.
I hope you can uh, settle your impulses and get through this. <laughs> Studying. All right. Smash that like and subscribe. I still have no idea where it is. I... Okay, bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. And until next time.